Virtual Experience by Christoph Hess. Experience as if it were one of those cranky vagaries of Heidegger, once meant to go and explore a country in peoples. In approaching the modern age seriously as a conquering of the world over, this movement of experience disappears, and those who are henceforth the sensitive subject lay their claim, regardless of whether they tour the world or withdraw into the Chateau de Montaigne. Those who never get the opportunity to travel to Italy can at least from stories or books experience something about its marvelous treasures. If, of course, experience then only refers to stories or printed pictures and text, which could otherwise be even more beautiful than Italy itself. Since the late 19th century, rapidly multiplied techniques of recording, storage, transmission, and duplication have seemingly brought distant realities ever closer, with these possibilities expanding immeasurably. The well-known man of novels who comes to the town from the country and finds everything shuttered has long ago become obsolete. The naif who knows nothing other than the inner circle of one's own work and family life has vanished from the interconnected world. To be in the know jostles itself in place of the traditional illiteracy, accomplished not so much from universal compul compulsory schooling, but from a culture industry extending across classes and boundaries, now with much more powerful channels at its disposal than film, radio, and magazines. However, the feeling of powerlessness keeps haunting even the ad nauseum experienced in the midst of inscrutable economic processes sliding over or at times clamping down on them, and this feeling is being yet again intensified by equally overpowering working technologies. The fully accessible world still appearing as strange and remote as ever has not only scared away the notorious idiocy of rural life, it also left the already dubious capacity for experience to atrophy, a capacity that, amongst other things, would be needed to set up the world in accordance with human needs. Experience comprises sensual perception, as well as its mental reflection, but also a knowledge acquired through colloquially repeated perception or drill, namely a routine allowing no experience whatsoever. What this commonly refers to is merely a certain life experience of life, such as none of us can avoid. Such is how E.T.A. Hoffman has, has Professor Lothario speak in a character of vain and stubborn scholars that still seems comical even today, not least because the conservative air professor is found to be again provocatively modest and reasonable amongst an audience moaning under an economy of attention. And right he is, experience is being temptingly proposed by philosophy since the twilight of scholasticism, plays only a minor part, particularly within the intellectual sphere, where it all comes down to sheer erudu erudition, to capricious intuitions and twisted eloquence. Empirical sciences naturally laying claim to experience reduce it to nothing else but the verifiable description of facts. For empirical observation, there are recording and measuring instruments, and if necessary, questionnaires, and there is computer software to solve the mathematical problems. However, the effort to gain a notion of mental experience cannot replace a field relying on the method of recording and quantification. Such experience is neither read on the bending of a dial nor represented through diagram. In order to build its concept, though, a critique of empiricism is not enough. Harder than the primacy of formalized methods is the challenge being posed by the substitution of mental experience by clever industry. This is what cultural theorists, formerly referred to as humanity scholars, know better than the conventionally unimaginative empiricists. The tempo is being set by internal competition, pushing intellectual trends to the fore. Whatever might be en vogue, a world to which one has virtually no relation based on substantive experience, must be either administratively rendered an object or otherwise be invented through ringing words. From this, a considerable part of the business is nourished while rebelling against committing itself to a specified field. 
From the critique of a technocratic division of labor arises a self-appointed license to universal competence, which, by any other name, is the total lack of competence. Lenin once believed that a housewife should be able to run the country. Today, a revolutionarily draped philosopher can chat on a train about Lenin and the state alongside the special theory of relativity. The notorious crisis of the supposedly exotic academic disciplines, which for years have not faced anything really exotic, demonstrates that something like experience is acquired second or third hand at best. Therefore, the droning neologisms express nothing else but an interest in symbolic surplus profit. Out of vanity rather than warranted necessity, they create word monstrosities that announce more and more frequently yet another turn and instantly promote corresponding studies. As capital and state-supported discourse confirms, the substance is of no concern to the form. This is nothing new. The expulsion of the spirit from the humanities doesn't spring from the takeover of electronic media, which ought to prescribe what can possibly be thought or spoken. However limited their extent, older writings or older writing systems have already done as much, and yet it is not clear in what new manner the new media influence or sometimes replace thought and how they form spiritual experience. Written on rattling typewriters, they were no better than dictated st st struddingly and uptight. Eckerd Henscheid reported already in the mid-70s that Carl Lyons Deschner elaborated the older breed among young German professors. The slob, the oracle, the weary, the semi-divine is in his own professional idiocy striding around empty-headed. A youth armed with Marx and Freud could easily pounce on such a character, but what they only attained was the mimicry of the hated institutions and personalities. Especially since the end of the student rebellion, the more recently established character has changed only in nuances and retains the same basic substance, showing off in a progressive jack-of-all-trades for the large epigonies and grand bluffers. This ingenuity, casually labeled as postmodern, in Germany belongs to the, histor the history of critical theory. Ironically, even more so since in since its intellectual overcoming to a time that the shaky concept of experience was making a career in the parodied shape of self-experience. The few critics of political economy who acquired appointment and rank following the waning protest movement already seemed hopelessly dated, at least in comparison with the new character car caricatured by Henscheid, which can, res which can retrospectively be recognized as a prototype of the now established cultural studies. Its sustained success is not simply based on the fact that the object of its occupation can hardly ever be identified and therefore can never be lost. In it is manifested the eternal recurrence of the new. Moreover, it favors the erroneous opinion that lacks that lack of aptitude or solely the absence of desire for intellectual integrity would harbor musical or even literary talent. An inscrutable importance reveals itself in contrived abracadabra and senseless far-flung metaphors. Not accidentally is Walter Benjamin, allegedly abandoned by Horkheimer back then, becoming more and more popular. He who once ridiculed the euphemistic lisp of sociology afraid to clarify political objects politically in order to instead wrap them in a web of academic empty phrases, is today one of the most distinguished sources of shameless, shameless lisps. His in inexhaustibly rich and indeed equally difficult accessible aesthetic experiences can be easily embraced by those who resolutely monopolize them. They indulge particularly in the opaque elements of his oeuvre, which most of all appeal to the freely adopted from Benjamin, agents of secret content, least of all eager for enlightenment. The philosophers following structuralism were not the first to pave the way for this kind of cultural studies. 
the rightly slandered Franco Latri, which has long since become transparent as a secret love for German ontology that seems to be just a symptom of the absence of experience. This again does not stop at the voracious reception of the French people, once so spiritual. One has to look for its reasons elsewhere. The pleasant talk of empty signifiers, however, ought to be taken for its word, insofar as language is only by way of exception good for expressing that which is experienced, and for bringing about particular kinds of experience at all. As a rule, it is instead a digression of its own knitted tone of voice. Concerning German academic language in particular, whose stale air the Leben, Leben's philosophy once sought to escape in a natural, healthy, fresh, at times coarse and certainly deceptive form, one can retrace its settling in the German Empire at the latest, in collegial proximity to German state officials. It basically consists of conceited and equally clumsy nominalizations being handed down, as it were, in order to bestow the authority of a certified document on the most dubious formulations and it maintains that attitude to this day. Additionally, within the soft core section of, of cultural studies in particular, it has gained a kind of maverick attitude, which long ago moved from apartment sharing communities into advertising agencies. Here, erratic expressions of a borrowed might already serve a self irony. In a lofty alienated shape, the whims of cultural studies reveal only the damage being done on a larger scale by the industry of the same name. It is to a considerable extent responsible for the socialized inability to experience, which makes its present felt even within the sphere of sociological and philosoph philosophical terminology. It is not coincidental that the phrase to gain experience sounds like a comradely imperative out of advertising's playbook. Experiences become incessantly imposed and are primarily collected in order to accumulate a fitting number, as if to prove one's own efficiency. What is to be experienced remains as indifferent as any product in an obstinately increasing production for its own sake. This Sisyphean task of gaining experiences, which is prescribed as useful to anyone willing to risk their neck, belongs to a respectable tradition after all. Even the bourgeois ideal of education, which would today translate into the optimal assets for self-management, ambitiously came from the assumption that subjectivity was formed not only by a sense of duty and humanistic erudition, however established with inhuman timpani, but also through experience. Yet the capacity for experience is not quite simply human and not indisputably given nor is it a qualification that could be acquired through diligence. Experience relies on objective conditions, futile to hope, however, it could, be re it could be rediscovered like something lost in a distant past. It might rather be found proximate to humanity that does not yet exist. Meanwhile, experience like the happiness that would be given unexpectedly seems at all possible only as an, ex as an exception. As an exception, it would likewise be possible to establish a world in which people were able to experience something other than pressure, fear, deprivation, sorrow, and depressing emptiness, as they do now, even in the abundant satisfaction of their needs. The material requisites have at least long been created, though under conditions of production which allow the former to constantly yield nothing other than the reproduction of those conditions and as such, those requisites might become increasingly improbable and ultimately useless for anything else. Perhaps one has already experienced that which is unregimented experience. Still, one has yet to grasp it through concepts. The danger of falling into whispering incantation is already felt by Goeth, who parodies the jargon of authenticity a century in advance. He sometimes implored a childhood friend to make plain to me what experience might be, but because he was full of nonsense, he put me off with fair words from one day to another, and at last, after great preparations, disclosed to me that true experience was properly when one experiences how an experienced man must experience in experiencing his experience. 
Experience can be proven only through an object one is actually experiencing. It is bound to the particular, always an experience of something, which is why every attempt of a generally accepted definition leads into the emptiness, or even worse, into the territories of tautological profundity. Experience is, be experience is to be conceived from an object to which a subject surrenders or immerses itself involuntarily. With a dubious concept of intuition, one comes plausibly closer to experience than with the formal critique of knowledge. Such an emphatic and almost musical concept of experience is historically closely bound with a notorious German inwardness. Parallel to the rationalistic critique of knowledge, this concept of experience finds profuse expression in the pathos of subjective sensitivity within the poetry of Sturm und Drang, which in a Lith Lutheran manner squares against French etiquette and yet comprehends the ongoing French Drang for political freedom. In Romanticism, this latter motif recurs in strangely draped shapes, sometimes traditional, sometimes chivalrous. But the model of the burgeoning German innately proud and cranky national sentiment is not the modern nation, i.e. the French Republic, but the declining Reich, wherein one wishes to res retrospectively identify a common destiny through shared language and culture. As from the cat catastrophic political consequences, however, one ought not to consider the experiences modeled in romantic literature contemptible. The discomfort that may be imposed on today's reader by all seemingly pastoral poetry also stems from the discomfort of what was already then a rather unsuccessful enlightenment of which those works are the expression. As such, they throw a dim light on the whole mishap, dragging with it the typically German concept of experience through Leben's philosophy and end existentialism. In characterizing the composer Schmuck, one of his novel's characters, Balzac provides a hint that the Germans cannot draw harmony from the mighty instruments of liberty, yet to play all instruments of music comes to them by nature. That this is no longer true comes in the end as something of a comfort. It should therefore come as no surprise that if there are hardly any young people today who dream of becoming great poets or composers, so that among adults are there not only any more uh, fearsome leaders, but perhaps also no great economic theoreticians among them, and that ultimately there will be no true political spontaneity. It may nevertheless be surprising that the work of an artist like the scarcely romantic Balzac assumes the experience of an entire epoch, which could not be remotely imaginable today. Whoever today withdraws into his garret to write a great comedy of their time has there, on their screen, the entire world before their eyes. Yet the world lays not at their feet, but rises unassailably above their head. Surely to its inhabitants 200 years ago, the world might have seemed to make sense, insofar as there was still a justifiable hope of someday redeeming at least the promises of freedom and equality. Whereas Beckett wrote novels on the absence of meaning, where experience gives expression to a far farcical expenditure unwavering and continued nonsense, most vividly illustrated by Malloy's sophisticated system of stone sucking. All the pertinent conclusions about fragmentation and distraction, which one gladly gives as an excuse to justify his own unsatisfying handicraft, perhaps only conceal the much graver finding that, along with spontaneity, imagination too, on which both artistic production and aesthetic experience subsist, got lost somewhere. Whether and under what conditions they might resurface in a world that tenders itself with users with clueless pride for an information or knowledge society remains to be seen. Cultural critics reasonably make automated technologies and the associated hustle and bustle responsible for literature to merge into the punctuality of word processing. However, already under similar pressure, Balzac, the little novel factory, accumulated his manuscripts. Unregimented experience is not to be confused with a life on the farm, nor with immediacy. 
Access to the world that appears to be completely immediate without the mediation of a technical medium does not determine in advance whether or not authentic experiences occur. A stroll through the forest guarantees just as little as a trip to the cinema. As so little can positively be said about unregimented experience in general, since the particular which makes it as such is lost in universal determinations, so can it not be directly indicated how technical media and their products form sensuous as well as spiritual experience. How they enrich experience with unexpected possibilities or deprive it of whatever kind of substance. The specific conditions under which some medium provide the possibility for experience are not to be misunderstood from the outset as regimentation. No one engaged in literature would claim that the rules of language, which must be known and respected, obstruct the path to possible experiences. Regarding photography, or more precisely, the particular form in which this medium is employed under present circumstances, Siegfried Krasauer, or Krakauer, in 1927, melancholy, melancholically remarked, Never before has an age been so informed about itself. If being informed means having an image of objects that resembles them in a photographic sense. Most of the images in the illustrated magazines are topical photographs which refer to existing objects. The reproductions are thus basically signs which may remind us of the original object that was supposed to be understood. The demonic diva. In reality, however, the weekly photographic ration does not at all mean to refer to these objects or your images. If it were offering itself as an aid to memory, then memory would have to determine the selection. But the flood of photos sweeps away the dams of memory. The assault of this mass of images is so powerful that it threatens to destroy the potentially existing awareness of crucial traits. In the illustrated magazines, people see the very world that the illustrated magazines prevent them from perceiving. The spatial continuum from the camera's perspective dominates the spatial appearance of the perceived object. The resemblance between the image and the object effaces the contours of the object's history. Never before has a period known so little about itself. In the hands of the ruling society, the invention of illustrated magazines is one of the most powerful means of organizing a strike against understanding. Even the colorful arrangements of the images provides a not insignificant means for successfully implementing such a strike. The contiguity of these images systematically excludes their contextual framework available to consciousness. The image idea drives away the idea. The blizzard of photographs betrays an indifference toward what the things mean. Many years later, feeling at home exiled in New York, Krakauer would entrust the photographic nature of film with the redemption of external reality, the knowledge of its inner relations, which once should have provided history with a fortunate turn, had proven unreliable in practice. Whatever technical media may adjust or first make recognizable, art by all means, traditionally an, er an area where experience shall and must prove itself in the gentlest of ways beyond practical ends, has thereby first and foremost only expanded. The overproduction of technical media clearly results from increased technological and commercial possibilities, as well as the conventional opinion, which has become infinitely generous about what, what is already or is still art. A distinction between seriousness and entertainment has rightly long been abandoned. Even the most serious art is never so boring as to cease entertaining you. The more tricky distinction is between seriousness and play. This distinction is unsuitable to separate high and low, good from bad art, from above, but rather permeates all art. Even serious thoughts on art part company with it. Marx claimed that artistic production by its very own nature, hostile to capitalist production, is the most damnably serious and shall thus remain even if one day a life of free association would be playfully easy to manage. Unexpectedly, it is Schiller's often condemned idea of art as a cheerful game that comes closer to the present moment, in that life, on the other hand, has really remained horribly serious. 
although it is not so serious that anyone would still expect a humanity fallen apart into more or less abom abominable cultures to enter into a history of its own making. Nor does anyone expect anything from aesthetic education. Within art, the game looks more like the impotence of certified people that can represent itself as omnipotent. Those prohibited from doing anything useful need not bother to consider purpose. Their creative playroom is without limit, as of a child's sandbox where he bakes his cake. It is hard to dismiss the impression that despite all the fabulous technical possibilities, the level of aesthetic productive forces decreases tendentially quicker than the average rate of profit. But it is even more difficult to grasp it conceptually. Noticeable at present is a certain indifference, if not bewilderment, towards the historical development of respective art forms. In them, above all, does experience condense itself. With a loss of tension in the history of art, the extent to which history still takes place appears questionable, as Adorno already said in the 1950s. The tradition of art, as well as the struggle against its obligations, are lost and consequently carried away in an empty, merry ride. It seems that not only art finds itself on such a ride. Altogether, the relations of production today resemble less a steel cage, which could give some the obvious idea of breaking out, than the pot from the fairy tale, which threatens to suffocate the hungry with its incessantly overflowing porridge. To bring it to a halt, the magic word would have to be spoken. In the fairy tale, it is the returning child that says, Stop, little pot. Experience is only made by those with hope. 